Welcome back to International Relations 101. I'm William Spaniel. Today's topic is the causes of war. Now that we're deep in this unit, I want to take a step back and think about what it means for something to cause war. And it turns out that this is a little bit more subtle than you might think. In this unit, our focus has been on the bargaining model. And what we've learned is that for war to occur between rational, unitary actors, we need one of the following. Perhaps we have incomplete information and incentives to misrepresent, so that each side in bargaining takes a firmer bottom line than they should, and they can't credibly communicate what their real bottom lines are, leading to demands that are incompatible and conflict as a result. Or we could have shifting power, where I am anticipating that in the future, you're going to be relatively more powerful than you are right now, and that forces me to think through whether I want to fight a costly war today or give lots and lots of concessions in the future. And it might be the case that I prefer just fighting a war today to avoiding that bad outcome later on. We've also looked at issue and divisibilities, where if the good that is at stake cannot actually be divided, then both of us might need the entire good to be satisfied and not want to fight a war. Although I have that caveat there of, well, maybe not really issue and divisibility, because as we've seen, if you can have side payments, some sort of ability to write a check for the rest of the good to make it so that you can actually negotiate over something, even if you can't negotiate over the good itself, you can always bargain over money instead, that you can avoid war under those circumstances. And then as that last bullet point, I'm just adding that there may be some other mechanism causing bargaining failure that we haven't explored in this class, or maybe that we are just unaware of as a discipline currently, but could be out there. So that's recapping what we've learned so far in this unit. But I want you to take what we've learned so far in this unit as explanations for war and compare it to what you may have heard as explanations for famous wars in the past. Let's start with the American Revolution. What do your high school history classes say about what caused this war? Well, like any other war, you probably have heard a lot of different narratives. But perhaps the most famous of them is this idea of no taxation without representation. The crown in Great Britain was levying taxes against American colonists. American colonists did not have a say in those taxes, and moreover thought that the taxes were too high. And as a consequence, they started the American Revolution. What about the American Civil War? What's the central narrative there? Well, it's basically impossible to tell any story about the American Civil War without having slavery as the central issue at stake. Slavery was the centerpiece of the economy in the South. However, by the time the Civil War was rolling around, it had become normatively unacceptable to a large portion of people who lived in the North. As a consequence, the North and South fought a war to see whether slavery would continue. What about World War I? It turns out that World War I is one of the most studied wars, and as a consequence, there are tons of explanations for what was going on below the surface that led to this war. But one that's pertinent to the argument that I'm making here is the idea of German colonial ambitions. By this theory, Germany had fallen behind in the colonial race, the scramble for Africa, as well as elsewhere in the world. They only had a handful of colonies. And as a result, Germany saw World War I as an opportunity to get back into the race, win the war, capture more colonies, and enjoy the benefits thereof. Why stop with one world war when there's another? What's the narrative behind World War II, and specifically the Pacific War? Well, this is similar to what we just talked about with Germany. Japan had colonial ambitions. They wanted to expand their empire further into Asia. And as a result, Japan initiated the Pearl Harbor attack to weaken the U.S. military to make that feasible. Moving to something a little bit more recent, what about Iraq's invasion of Kuwait? We've touched on this one before, and the central narrative here is oil. Following the Iran-Iraq war, Iraq was deep in debt, and they were unhappy that Kuwait was releasing tons of oil into the international marketplace, driving down prices. 
Moreover, there was an Iraqi accusation that Kuwait was stealing some of Iraq's oil reserves. All of this was the primary motivation, at least ostensibly, for the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait. Finally, what about the Syrian civil war? Well, here the narrative is that the Assad regime was brutal on its citizens and it imposed such restrictive and extractive policies that the citizens eventually got fed up and started a war to try to overthrow the Assad regime. This is where I want you to take a step back and see the value added of the bargaining approach. None of the explanations I just gave you, explanations that are common in history textbooks, within the media, and perhaps everyday conversations. None of those explanations are sufficient for war. And the reason is because none address war's inefficiency puzzle. Why do states sometimes choose to resolve their differences with inefficient fighting when bargaining, in theory, leaves both better off? In this light, the recipe for war is twofold. First, you need a grievance, something like taxation without representation, or slavery, or territorial ambitions. And second, you need a bargaining problem, like incomplete information or shifting power. With only one of those and not the other, you do not get conflict. If you have grievance without a bargaining problem, then you'll find a settlement that both sides prefer to war. If you have a bargaining problem without a grievance, well, congratulations, you have nothing to fight over. The high school history textbooks that you will read will be focusing almost entirely on grievance. They will not be discussing the bargaining problem. And that's a big issue if you're trying to think about what causes war. The cause for war has to be twofold. It has to be a grievance and it has to be a bargaining problem. You have to put the two of those things together, otherwise you do not have war. In political science, we tend to focus on the bargaining problems and not so much the grievances. And the reason for that is it seems that the bargaining problems are more tractable to resolve than the grievances are. We really think that there are only two types of bargaining problems. There's information problems and commitment problems, those shifting power issues and not knowing exactly how much to offer the other side. Issue and divisibility doesn't really get very far because of the presence of side payments. And although I'm not going to go into detail here, you can actually pigeonhole that into a commitment problem if you work hard enough. But what that means is that if we can figure out institutional structures that resolve information problems and resolve commitment problems, that solves all war, or at least wars that we can attribute to rational unitary actors. In contrast, there are way too many types of grievances. It's probably not even worth trying to count how many there are. And as a result, if you try resolving one of those, you don't get very far in terms of reducing war more generally. Again, that's why we are tending to focus in political science on these bargaining problems and not so much have a focus on the grievances. This will end our main theoretical discussion on the causes of war within this course. If you are interested in learning more about bargaining problems, I have an entirely separate course that focuses just on that subject called Bargaining and War. You can check down below, I'll have information that links to that if you're interested in it. But other than that, for now, that is all. I hope you enjoyed this lecture, and I hope to see you next time. Take care.